ready to introduce. All right. John, we are live. All right. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is John Barton. I am the director of the Stanford Architectural Design Program. Welcome to the second lecture of our 2021 Architecture, Landscape, Urban Design Spring Lecture Series. The theme of this year's series is the public realm. As of 2019, approximately 84% of the US population lives in urban areas, up 20% from 1950. This increasing density is having dramatic effects, both positive and negative. The Bay Area is one of many urban regions that are struggling with transportation and housing crises, and we have a glaring socioeconomic divide yielding greater physical segregation. Yet research shows that the more we engage with people who are different from us, the more creative we become together. A diverse community is better equipped to develop successful solutions to complex problems. Cities are truly incubators of innovation and the public realm is the great mixing chamber where new ideas are conceived. We have purposely invited talented designers who are shaping our urban cultural centers and the open space within and without them. Before we begin, I wanna thank Dave Lennox, University Architect and Director of Campus Planning and Design, and Zach Posner, Director of Architecture, Padma Kudukudu, and Diana Lynn for their help in organizing the series. I would also like to thank the American Institute of Architects Silicon Valley chapter for their help in advertising the series and registering our program for continuing professional education. At the end of the lecture, your attendance will be automatically noted and submitted to the AIA. Our next lecture is in two weeks, and we are pleased to have Kona Gray from EDSA, who will also be held virtually via Zoom webinar just like today. Protocol for today's webinar is per uh, the last one, uh, which is that we would ask you to use the Q&A section to post any questions you may have during the lecture. You can use that at any time during the lecture. We have allocated 10 to 15 minutes at the end of the lecture for Q&A. The moderator will group similar questions together and will present them to the speaker as time permits. Thank you. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Brad Clopefill. Architecture, architect, educator, and principal of Allied Works, Brad Clopefill has realized diverse projects across the US and internationally. Over the past two decades, Clofield has received widespread acclaim for his work on creative workplaces, academic and cultural institutions, and for crafting powerful spaces for art and interaction. A native of Oregon, Clofield's body of work is as informed by the landscapes and history of place as it is by his formal training. His architecture pairs an intensive focus on the, special, on the specific character of each project with an understanding of the transformative possibilities of space, light, form, and material. Clopeville's creative and cultural works include num are numerous and include National Veterans Memorial Museum in Columbus, Ohio, the National Museums Museum Center of Canada in Calgary, the Clifford Still Museum in Denver, and the Contemporary Art Museum in St. Louis. Clofield has designed private residence offices and creative workspaces, including the Pixar Animation Studios in Emeryville, California, studio and production spaces for Theory and Helmut Lang in New York City, and the renovation of the world-renowned restaurant 11 Madison Park in New York City. Current and recent projects include a U.S. Embassy compound in Mozambique and the Providence Park Stadium expansion, which is the home of the MLS Portland Timbers, and the NWLS Portland Thorns. Clopeville founded Allied Works Architecture in his native Portland, Oregon in 1994 and opened a New York City office in 2003. The recipient of numerous design awards, Clopeville has held professorships and lectured widely throughout Northern California and Europe. He earned his bachelor's degree, bachelor's architecture degree at the University of Oregon and holds an advanced degree in architecture design from Columbia University's Graduate School of Architecture. Please give a warm digital Stanford welcome to Brad Clopeville. Thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> I want to. I want to feel that digital warmth. That's, that's a new one. Um, it's wonderful to be here with you all online from the comfort of home. Um, I just have to make sure 
this slide advances. We never, we never did that. Okay, I figured out how to do that. So public realm is a very charged topic. It's an interesting, um, it's an interesting topic to bring up at this particular point in our culture. Um, the possibilities of the public realm, I think, are are well known, and the and the role that the public realm has played in our lives historically is is clear. Um, I think it's a very interesting topic today, as we all know, given the, what the pandemic has done to to uh, the idea of public. And it's so interesting that at the exact same time, the uh, tragedy of George Floyd and others have led to this unbelievable outpouring of protest um, and, and the public expressing their outrage and voice uh, in spaces as unconventional as the Burnside Bridge in Portland, Oregon, and all over the country, which continues today, sad, sadly enough. But the public realm, I think, is now becoming a, a form of battleground, which, which is uh, something none of us ever anticipated. I mean, there's legislation to keep people from forming protests. There's legislation today to forgive people if they uh, run their cars into people who are illegally protesting. That was in uh, Iowa and Oklahoma. I mean, it's, it's a critical time for thinking about the public realm. Uh, and certainly as architects, it's something that we have to take very seriously. And, and we've all aspired to it over the course of our careers. I think it's probably the highest aspiration of architecture to think about the power of rooms, what they offer and inspire, how they're occupied, how they change over time. Um, um, yeah, it's, it's an active and ever changing. I mean, it couldn't be a more dynamic time to think about what is the nature of the public realm, both as public open space, which is co-opted and claimed in various forms um, and, uh, and, 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 and building space at the same time. I mean, we've been thinking about a project uh, in the office that we call Cultural Catalyst that thinks uh, we're beginning to think about a way to dedicate different kinds of public space for the voice of the public, because you know, right now people are doing it. And it's, be, it's being uh, declared illegal. You know, there's police action. It, it creates a kind of exchange with police and control. Whereas, if there was a way to dedicate space, um, rather than have these kind of activities occur in a, in, in co-opted space, it would it would be it'll be an interesting debate as we as we move forward. Because the public has never been as energized to express their voice and their opinion. Um, and it would be wonderful to sustain that. And I think we as architects, landscape architects, uh, people working in the cultural realm have a responsibility to uh, enable that and inspire that and catalyze that in the, in the spaces we make. Um, we at Allied Works, you know, we've been fortunate to work in the public realm, in nonprofits, in museum space, various kinds of cultural organizations, in schools, um, and think about how the buildings engage the public, um, how one how one extends invitations, which we'll get into in a little bit more. But it's interesting. This moment in our culture, I think, has has caused us and others, and rightfully so, to question the very nature of what a public institution is and what makes it public and who is it public for. Um, and these are all things that we can talk about later and I'll touch on in the talk. But um, before that, I'll just, I'll just talk about our practice a little bit uh, because I think the nature of our practice informs a tremendous amount uh, the spirit and character of the buildings we create. Allied Works was named to be a creative collaborative uh, studio, uh, a collective effort, a collective effort of both experts and the individuals working in the office. You know, a, a kind of choir of voices thinking about what's possible in both the way we work, uh, the kind of projects we do, how we address them, how we engage them. Um, there's a spirit in our office that every project is an entirely new beginning, um, which doesn't make it the most profitable model of architecture, I might add. But, but the idea of exploration and the tools we use, 
the, the methods in which we engage the, the individuals involved in the process, um, all of that spirit of inquiry and collective conversation fuels everything we do. And there are, also, there are also some abiding ethics to our work. Um, and that, that, that word ethics is important to me personally and, and professionally. Um, I, think, I, I think the idea of uh, ethical pursuits um, of, a, of a practice that pursues projects of meaning and, and actually tries to discern the meaning of each project um, is, is critically important. I think it's a responsibility of, of all architecture. And this notion of calling, um, the, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a term that has a lot of charge and a lot of uses, um, being called to a, a practice, being called to a place. But what it does in, 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 in our approach to design is it inspires a, a process of listening, a way of, a way of pursuing a project with a spirit of inquiry to, to see what speaks in this particular problem or this question or this institution, um, to listen to the conversations, to try to discern a way that the building expresses its kind of fundamental voice and what it aspires to be. One of the ways we do that, primary ways we do that is investigating the nature of place and all the projects we've had it's such a diversity and continues to be such a diversity of place, urban and rural, different cities with different characters, looking at those places, trying, trying to determine what the architecture can contribute, what, what conversations it can extend in those places. Um, and it, 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 certainly the, the nature and character of the institution itself, the mission of the institution plays into that. Um, and then we use various tools, any tool that we can, um, ceramic, glass, stone, wood, to, to try to evoke a conversation of an, arch of an architectural response to, to, to this place and, and this, this character. It also, we are also inspired in the office to think about the nature of service. We talk a great deal about what the building can serve um, it's, it's, a, it's another form of inquiry, I think, that rather than use the building as a, a solution for a problem or use the design as an, objective, as an objectified signifier of, of what something aspires to, we, we look very deeply into the possibilities of, of what the building can offer. I, th I think I was writing the other day about this and that most architecture is a closed system of return. And then it's a professional practice that produces a product and there's an exchange of money and there's an end object, right? And I think the spirit with which we approach architecture is open-ended that, that the building really stops with a kind of opening of, of, of the rooms of the nature of the place uh, and hopefully elicits a character and quality of generosity that then begins to invite interaction, and I and I think that intention is critical. I know I know it's it may sound like uh, arbitrary or or, um, or 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 gratuitous language, but but it's absolutely critical. I think the spirit of of with which the investigation begins and and continues in spaces has everything to do with the solution. It has everything to do with the outcome. So. Uh, Widening Kennedy wanted a space where 450 people in an advertising agency could gather and it turns into one of the most important uh, civic spaces in the city with concerts and, and all different kinds of activities. Um, you know, the National Music Center, we chose to open the performance space to the entire building so that the performers come in and actually play the building. And so you can hear the music from the various stairways and walkways. Throughout, throughout, the, throughout the building. Clifford Still, the idea of offering a space, giving a home to this amazing collection of paintings and, and scaling the space, creating a quality of light and character that allows the individuals to engage in a very intimate way. So I actually think also this, this idea of exchange in public space is critical. And that exchange can be collective, and that exchange can be 
can be intimate too, and it has everything to do with the charge of, of the architecture. And then of course, museums, they, they, they have a dual mission of inspiring the artists for specific installations. And I apologize, I, we don't have the name listed of the artist on the right, which was an installation for the space and of the space. And then obviously for people to engage in those spaces in conversations and, and in unforeseen ways. So um, I, I, I think that idea of exchange is critical to the public realm. Actually, probably one of the most critical things, you know, rather than the architecture providing you with the answers and a kind of closed narrative, the architecture extending that invitation and that generosity um, is, is, uh, is important. I also think that the idea of invitation itself is a, is a critical one today more than ever. I mean, it's been ongoing. When I began designing museums 20 years ago, there was a conversation of how to get people to come to museums, how to get people to join, you know, membership that was going down, people were resisting museums. Um, and I think there were sort of twofold reasons in that. Uh, I think at the time, programming had a tremendous amount to do with that. Were they showing contemporary art? Were they showing programs that people cared about? Um, you know, which gets into issues of populism, which we could discuss as well. But also, I think it had to do with just the, the perception of, of the institutions themselves. Who were they for? You know, cultural institutions determined to be elite and exclusive, you know, whether, whether they were or not, that was the kind of reputation that you needed a, a, a certain imprint to engage those institutions and, and, and engage in those conversations. Um, so I think that the, we've talked a lot in the art or continuing to discuss the, the nature of invitation that the building extends, you know, two bombastic ones. Well, one beautiful and elegant one with the Kimball on the left. And of course, we all recognize St. Peter's on the right, but, but the iconography, the imagery, how one, how one extends that invitation. I mean, the, the Met steps couldn't be a more beautiful, wonderful civic space, public realm in the form of an invitation. And yet other ones, because of their scale and character become daunting and exclusive. So how does one do this? And we'll talk about Providence Park. The, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's a ballpark that requires uh, entrance fee, requires sort of joining a club, if you will. And how does it engage the public and feel a part of the city? All of our projects have that spirit of, of the collective of finding spaces and existing buildings and new buildings. Um, this is the contemporary uh, uh, Northwest College of Art, um, carving out space where people could come together and, and sort of do what they want. And this interesting, one of the early projects we did, the Booker T. Washington High School, was the first uh, black high school in Dallas. So when we engaged uh, the renovation and extension of that building, we engaged the alumni the last alumni group to come out of the high school and you know how we bridge between the historic community that building served to the new much more diverse community um, was an amazing amazing conversation and how you maintain that legacy and that spirit and then you know to to you know the as the highest um, and sometimes perceived as the most exclusive institution back to the met when we uh, were one of two finalists for that, thinking about opening up the building and how does one extend a new invitation with new pieces of architecture to the Met, you know, uh, adding a new wing on the park side, creating a park entrance, kind of re-energizing the conversation, both with the park and the public, um, basically engaging ideas of transparency from a spatial point of view, from a literal point of view, which is also very charged in, in art and conservation. But this spirit of opening things up, this is a really fun project. We just finished a, a, tiny, a tiny little story of the director of a tiny historical society in uh, Central Oregon in Corvallis, uh, Central Willamette Valley called and said she wanted to build a new museum and she did it <laughs> you know we we joined forces she raised the money and and built this uh small building for this community in in corvallis that has just energized the downtown energized the community the art community the historical community so the catalytic nature of these buildings to inspire people 
uh, and inspire them to engage is is an ongoing is still an ongoing and very rich conversation. And 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 that awareness of 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 who is being invited into the building. I mean, I I think it has affected programming radically. You know, from symphonies, from ballet to to obviously art museums. Um, of, of how to, to, at the same time, we honor the kind of cultural heritage that we have, um, however complex and charged it may be rel relative to all kinds of issues, um, how, how we honor that heritage, but also inspire people to engage in the conversation and, and let them understand that these institutions, these, these, these pieces of architecture are just frames for a conversation. I mean, that's, that's really what it is. And I, and I think relative to invitation, that is the way we think about the architecture, that the architecture is really framing a conversation, that, it, that it's, not, uh, it's not trying to uh, necessarily be the, the, the narrative of the conversation. Um, obviously, iconography is a huge issue. What does the building communicate? How does it communicate? Who is it communicating to? All of those things we need to think about, you know, images that we've talked about, some of them that we know, some of that we don't know. I mean, you can you can ask yourself. I was looking at this slide earlier and wondering if there's really any difference between these historical uh, examples. Uh, you know, I, I would contend, frankly, you know, maybe the National Gallery in Berlin is the most inviting, and who would have thought Mies would be the most inviting? But um, you know, all of them are a little intimidating to me, but we could talk about that. Yeah, where it's quite, quite beautiful, um, quite beautiful buildings, but all somewhat uh, through their iconography. And I mean, I, I feel as though in some ways, I mean, maybe all architecture, that's a question we can ask ourselves. Maybe all architecture in the way it communicates to the public realm um, asks for a price of admission. I mean, that's a really interesting question. And of course, co-option of iconography, both terrifying examples, one recent, one historic. Um, co-option appropriation of imagery to, to glorify uh, some kind of mythologized past, which itself, especially in the nature of Virginia, is quite fraught. Um, so how one signifies engagement is a very, very charged thing. And what makes something exclusive, one could ask, is novelty the only form of engagement we have now where people engage something because it's a new product, a new image they haven't seen before, no matter the, the, the content. It's just a very fascinating conversation. We, you know, at, at Allied Works, I think we begin these projects and the search for the voice of the project and this conversation of service and invitation with a little more humility, I think, rather than a language of architecture, we try to, you know, preconceived language of architecture, we try to find the spirit and nature and the presence of the building in the, in the National Music Center, looking to the landscape, as I mentioned earlier, which I actually, interestingly enough, happened to be one of the first landscapes that Clifford still painted, the hoodoos in Southern Alberta, just coincidentally. But trying to find an, uh, a kind of iconographic presence, in this case for the National Music Center of Canada, you know, leading to sort of landscape inspired rooms that weave throughout the space. And these interstitial volumes is where the music plays up from the uh, performance space in the lobby. The Clifford Still Museum, a, a prairie building, you know, ne next to buildings, the, the Denver Art Museum and other buildings who whose iconography was very extroverted an attempt to create a much more introverted and intimate space. It was a small building to begin with. So thinking of a quality of the space that kind of pressed the earth that held you to the surface of the prairie, you know, looking for inspiration beyond just the language of the architecture itself or the kind of ability to, to architecture to, to express uh, it, it, its own iconography, but really what, again, this idea of service um, competition final for the Holocaust Memorial in the UK with a 
concept model that is the testimony of Holocaust survivors formed into uh, a kind of prayer shawl, which became the inspiration for the building, um, which was filled with the voices and the stories and the, the narratives, a kind of sound cone in the in the park next to next to Parliament. So what one searches for, the language one uses. Um, I think I think again that what what you listen for, uh, what you try to determine the building can serve. It's it's very interesting because people come to you asking for a building that has functional needs, and they always begin with functional needs, and um, sometimes aspire to greater things. And they all want beautiful buildings. There's no question about that, and that's is is critically important, right? But I think. For us, and the more we learn from architecture as we continue to build spaces and, and deal with different cities and sites and, and clients, the more we build the importance of, of listening and kind of waiting to determine what, can, or, you know, ask this question about what the building can really offer. It's, a, it's an extremely challenge because many buildings can meet the needs. We know that. Um, but perhaps I, I think, and in most cases, the building can can offer more. Um, and this idea of, of, as I mentioned earlier, of buildings, public buildings being catalytic, being amplifiers of culture, being frames for activities, you know, rather than being narrative objects that, that kind of create the illusion of action and activity, but really being, being things that, that move, move ideas forward, that, that invite people to challenge the way, they, the way they think. And a building can embody that, it can, mani it can manifest that. Um, and public buildings can, and you know, cultural catalysts, the idea of cultural catalysts, as I mentioned earlier, is, is an abiding thought with us right now. And again, learning and learning from some of our, our projects we've done in the past through their successes and failures, um, trying to, to discern the original intent and then the life of the building as it's been kind of set, set in motion over the, over the years. Um, but, you know, buildings being used in unconventional ways. I love this thing at the University of Michigan. We already talked about the White and Kennedy previous slide. Oh. And I forget the name of the artist. I'm so bad. They should be on the slides. I apologize. But you know that where, where an artist uses the building as an installation and kind of co-ops even the iconography of the building couldn't be more exciting. And I think that's that's a sign of success when you set a building in motion and and it becomes a kind of free body that people use and employ and engage in in in, in various in various ways. Um, I'm talking fast. I have to have another sip. So I'll talk a little bit uh, about some of our projects and in their different intentions and uh, in their different inspirations and how they engage this idea of the public realm. Um, boy, starting with one of the most difficult ones. Uh, it's an embassy project that we were given maybe six, six years ago that is now just nearing completion. Uh, U.S. Embassy in, in Mozambique. And at the time, um, they were trying to disrupt the standard program uh, for building embassies where they basically became walled compounds with very small openings and were communicated something very, very exclusive and basically repelled <laughs> interaction. That's what they did. I mean, it's really uncute. So having the conversation with the State Department when we got this project, beginning, you know, thinking about what the building wanted to communicate about the nature of the United States in various countries. We're actually about to begin another one in Mongolia. Fascinating. Fascinating to go to these various cultures and think about the spirit of invitation. This building is on the on the oh wait, I'll go back one. This building is on the coast on the Indian Ocean in, in um, southern Mozambique. We hid all of the security walls, lowered them down in ha-has in the landscape, which required security walls. We 
created um, a building that was transparent um, and resists bomb blasts and all these other qualities of things it has to do. Basically, we attempted to create a building with all of the security restrictions that are critical um, in today's context to create a building that was transparent and open and, and inviting that communicated the spirit of invitation to the world. Um, the larger in the image in the lower left is the embassy building itself with various outbuildings, the 10 acre site that we designed. And the building section, as you look through, there's various security barriers that one has to go through. There's, so there's, there's various levels of invitation that you're allowed to, to experience in the building, but I wanted the building to feel when you walked in the front door that you could see the entire building. So you see up and out uh, all the way through the bu building that it is transparent to the people who experience it. It's transparent in the landscape, uh, connects itself to the sea and the ocean and the public and you see activity, you see the kind of life of the embassy, you're not excluded from it, even if you only are allowed to em enter the lobby. But, but hopefully the building will have that sense of generosity. It has a very technical skin, by the way, which I'm not really discussing in this project, but it's a sun shading device that allows the building to be open to the views and the public and block out all of the direct sunlight for the 10 hours of the workday. And it changes to the various facades and the various orientations. So each facade has a different, a different cladding and a different sunscreen. Um, I love the, the range here, <laughs> going from an embassy to a, a, a soccer stadium, which is by nature is somewhat exclusive, the price of attendance, whereas the club itself is not exclusive people from obviously for those of you that know soccer people from all backgrounds and all communities are very very excited and devoted and in portland oregon the stadium is two blocks from our office there so it was a very and we've been soccer fans for a, a, a very long time so the opportunity to build this addition to the building um, was was very special for us and and we we designed a stadium that was open um, we opened, we, we really attempted the, and, and worked with the city, they asked for it as well, which is also enlightened. So we built the stadium addition over the street, created an open arcade from which you can see down to the field without paying admission. And then from the distance, you see into the stadium and the nature of the, of the stadium itself. It's a structural solution, which is important to Allied Works. I mean, kind of the primary means of expression of a building. So the, the structure as it comes down to the street is intention, it's these wires that creates the primary perception of a building, the transparency of this enormous structure that reaches over and cantilever some 150 feet. We created a vertical tray of people so that as you move through the concourses, you see back to the city, that's the lower concourse on the, on the left, where you see into the stadium. So there's an exchange between the city at all times between the stadium when it's silent and when there's game days. And then when you're up on the concourses, you get connected back to the place, to, to Portland. Um, so so it, it kind of turned the stadium inside out, both structurally and activity wise. Um, and don't these make you nostalgic for a time when we could be together? <laughs> like just the noise of the crowd right now is something that I would Love, love to hear. So um, we are switching gears again. I mean, the diversity of things we get to explore is, is so, so exciting. And I, and I think it has everything to do with the nature of our practice and this collective spirit of, of inquiry that we can apply to different building types and bring together the experts we need. We had never done a stadium before when we were invited to do that addition. And we ended up finding 5,000 seats that they didn't know they could get. So creating opportunities with fresh eyes, fresh spirit of inquiry, the way we approach those projects. Um, I, I think it's made the, the, we've learned so much from the diversity of the practice um, and it continues to build. The, the Penn State uh, University of the Palmer Art Museum kind of goes back to our, to our, I guess, typological strength in some ways. Um, this is a very, very exciting project that we just finished the construction documents on. Um, 
It is a new art museum for Penn State University on the grounds of the botanical gardens, which you see on the right and in the diagrams. And so we created a building that meanders across the site and creates different courtyards, different ways of engaging and relating to the gardens and the campus and the larger sites in, in, the, in the mountains of, of central Pennsylvania, really beautiful, beautiful context. Early concept models, where we thought of the building as really being part of the earthworks, the way the earth was created, you know, with the different gardens and the building would create its own gardens as it meandered. These were different concepts that we presented to the client. And in the end, the building became a, a, a series of kind of meandering interlocking forms that intersect in two story spaces that you see in the X's, um, create different views and orientations to the gardens, gather in landscape internally, connect to the landscape externally. Um, the plans just to give you a sense, this is the entrance of the building on the right and you pass through the building as the primary entrance to the botanical gardens with an education wing, an education wing to the left. And then against the park, you see the sculpture court on the left, screens that look into galleries that are again using some of that same shading technology so that the visitors can actually see into the building and see the art, but the light is uh, diffused and protected. And then a transparent two story lobby that moves through the building on the far right. And each public space in the building is open and people can walk in. You know, we're controlling the security and in unique ways, but it's really an invitation for the students. We talked about this a tremendous amount, um, that the students feel like the building is theirs, that they can come and use it in any way they choose, not, not necessarily just to view art. They can come and hang out there, they can come for classes there, they can meet their friends there, that it become a place that's really embedded and connected to the university with sculpture courts and gardens. And then of course, something we, care a great deal about at Allied Works. And, and I think I can say we are truly learning to master the quality of natural lights and galleries that you see in one of the double height spaces um, on the right. And even on the second floor galleries, glimpses back to the landscape, you know, across double height spaces to the right, out to the entrance on the left, that you're always, even though you're moving through this kind of labyrinth of these tubes of space that interact, um, you're always oriented back to, to the space and presented and framed with, with different, different relationships. Um, very exciting, very, very exciting project um, that will actually begin construction soon. And, and, and from, a, from just a pandemic anecdote, we produced all of the working drawings for this building, finished the design and all the working drawings during the pandemic remotely. So the, uh, the, the ability of people and our team, and I'm sure many of your, your teams and the people you work with to adapt has been, it's been one of the most extraordinary, one of the various things we've learned, isn't it? We adapt. Um, some, of our, some of our built projects, National Veterans Memorial that finished a, a couple years ago um, was a, a, an invited competition, I suppose, where the first idea of the building was public space. You know, before we had a thought on the interior, before we really understood the nature of what the collection or the narrative of the building was, we had this idea of lifting the earth into a sanctuary, a, a sanctuary that would be ceremonial, that would be memorial, but also a commissioning space, a welcome home space, a celebration space for veterans and yet for the whole city of Columbus, Ohio, where it is. And that's how the building began, really, as this idea of civic space, of, of public realm. They had, people have free access to it. It's not closed off. And then it generated a structural system, a kind of weaving structural system to hold these large spans up and to kind of hold the ground of this open site in the park. And you move through these spirals of gallery spaces. Um, and there it is, you've, there it is in, the, in, the, in the city itself. It, it oddly looks like a rendering, I think, because the whole park is new. Everything is so new, but is actually, it's actually the, the building itself with that sanctuary space. 
and the processional ramp that leads leads up to it. And that is an unprogrammed space that can be used. Certainly, it is curated and it's controlled by, by the by the museum memorial. But um, it is really a civic space offered to the city, offered back to the city of of Columbus. Um, and it's used in a, a, a myriad of, of different ways. And then the galleries themselves, you know, it's, it's a building oven for uh, the veterans of our wars. And as we were working, I had one of the most memorable experiences of my career working with, uh, checking my watch there, I'm working with Senator John Glenn, who was the instigator of this. Senator Glenn wanted this building to be about one thing, uh, primarily, certainly, certainly uh, to honor the veterans, but also to elevate this idea of service, which was absolutely coincident to our ethics of architecture um, and a perfect platform. And it was inspiring to us and Ralph Applebaum as the, as the exhibit designer, um, but, the, but the, to try to inspire people with stories of, of what veterans have given and why, and why they give and how they give and, what their families sacrifice. And, and it's a much larger story. It's fascinating. It was really a fascinating, fascinating experience. And we we made a home for these for these stories. And you know, so different than art and performance. Um, just an amazing, meaningful, meaningful thing. Uh, a, a new graduate school of art building for Pratt Institute, which I attended for a year. So it was a very wonderful project that was put on hold, but I'll just walk you through the possibilities of it. The analytics we did of campus, you know, it was a campus that hadn't had a new building in, oof, I can't even remember now, 30 years, something like that. Um, so trying to discern an order and the little arrows on the right uh, and the blue block is really, is, is the site that we chose through the analytic process. And then again, making a building that's a kind of shutter that has art walls and, you know, encloses the, the, the studios and galleries, but invites light in and glimpses through above, you know, sort of sort of establishes its home, protects the space that needs to be protected, but then connects the way it needs to connect. And uh, again, a series of structural walls, which Allied Works, you know, we, we tend to use as our primary language, but structural walls that flip and fold and overlap and turn. Um, and then also a masonry with masonry bearing walls that are actually hollow, hollow hollow masonry walls with, with brick with brick cladding. So a building, it's, it's an interesting thing with art buildings and it's the same with art museums. Um, they need to be exclusive to a certain extent to kind of hold and protect things and have walls for art and control the light. And so how, how one makes them engage, engage the external world, and in this case, the greater campus has to do with the kind of spatial transparencies and what you can see in and through and how you can engage in the kind of openings that you give to courtyards, the, the, the transparency even through the structure and the way you bring light down in. I think this is the last project. I'll just touch on the Clifford Still Museum because it's, it's an interesting uh, project and in that it's a public building for a single voice. So it has inherent in it a kind of intimacy, you know, a, a, a public building that's really intended for one person's story, the kind of story of Clifford Still's life work uh, on this site in, in Denver that had a, a public space in front of it. And so the conception of the building was that the building would be embedded in a grove of trees. And then, you know, it may, it may take 30 years, <laughs> but, but uh, that you wouldn't really even see the building as an object. And I think it goes back to iconography and some of those discussions that the intent of this building is that you would engage this park under the shade of these trees of which this neighborhood had very little. And you would move under the canopy and into the building and the canopy would be really the invitation to engage the site and the architecture and you, uh, the image on the right, you slide under a very large cantilever and then move up, uh, move up a stair into the galleries or engage, um, engage the archives and open storage on the, on the lower floor. And that's the entrance that you'll move into under the 
under the canopy. So the, the building will only exist as a kind of image of shadow for the leaves and the sun. We had a lot of conversation about the texture of the concrete creating different shadows and different time of year, different day. Um, and then you engage this, the world of this individual's voice. And, you know, to make a building of that, that establishes an individual relationship with someone's work that invites in the public yet is still, still intimate, still, still about your individual relationship with this person's ideas and work, that's the closed or the open storage and the archives in the basement and where the natural light is draws you up um, into the galleries and off the galleries, there's some places of contemplation and reflection in these little private gardens, which eventually got benches, by the way. Um, and then, you know, the sense of being held in this heavy building of concrete held to the earth, but made light by, by, you know, by the light pouring through that body of concrete and, and in, in this kind of labyrinth and, and wonderful journey through the history of, 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 of Clifford Sills paintings and the, again, the kind of individual relationships that you can have with, with the work. It's, it's really, I mean, I love going back to the building, not because it's my piece of architecture, but the fact that it is such an intimate experience, it's just so uncommon. You know, all, all the museums are just getting larger and larger and larger. And, and to be in one where you can really spend time and establish that relationship, individual relationship with the work is, is a kind of uncommon, uncommon gift. To wrap up, um, the text really repeats many of the things that, that we talked about or that I talk about today. And, and again, the, the idea of a building as an open frame, as a catalyst, uh, as a building that invites dialogue and challenge, you know, it's, it's, I don't think it could be more important at this moment in history that we as architects consider all of these things and change how we think about things and continually challenge ourselves to, to challenge our preconceptions of what each institution is, what's the nature of public, and, and again, who we are extending that invitation to and work as hard as we possibly can to make it as broad and open uh, as possible. And, and one of the things I believe deeply in, as a kind of wrapping up, is that a, if a building is filled with wonder, wonder strikes every possible demographic. It requires no previous knowledge. It requires no price of entry. It requires no narrative exp explanation. Architecture has the ability to strike that sense of wonder and awe in, in our hearts. Um, and, I, and I think that is probably the greatest, greatest unifier um, that, that architecture can offer. So thank you for those of you out there um, for, for setting through this with me. I'd love to, I'd love Thanks, to Brad. conversation. I'm gonna applaud for you so you just feel a little <laughs> of the yeah. warmth. Yeah, where's the exchange? Speaking of exchange, just, I'm not getting the exchange that I usually. Oh, I'm getting tons of text messages, so you're doing great. Um, <laughs> I just want to ask you a few questions. I'll let you have a drink. Um, mm -hmm. I was lucky enough to visit your office a few years ago and, and meet with you, and uh, I saw the amazing range of physical models that you guys produce in your practice, and they're all sorts of weird tactile materials. It's, it's really broad range of stuff. Can you talk a little bit about that part of the design process for you? Yeah, there was one slide that had some of that, um, that I mentioned. Yeah, it's, it's really this spirit of open inquiry of like, what, you know, when we're, when we're asking this question about what's the nature of this building, what can it really become, or, you know, what's the voice of the building? looking at the place, looking at the spirit, you know, Clifford Still wanting to be intimate and compressed has material implications. You know, other buildings want to be lighter and more transparent. Um, that the little museum in Corvallis, you know, seeing every window into every gallery is the building being light and reflective and kind of sparkling. 
So that those visceral qualities become spatial qualities, or they could be first spatial qualities that become material qualities, but it determines the language of the architecture itself. And so when we're searching for that, we try different things out. You know, we have, like you said, we have a model for a museum in Lausanne, Switzerland, that's a, that's a split piece of wood because we had this idea of just splitting the building open to the landscape and the views of the lake. So, it, you know, we, we find ways you know, I think of architecture as a visual industry that has to be fed. You know, the creative process is a visual process. And so before we even know what the building looks like, we try to express the nature and character, potential nature and character of the building. You know, there was a, there was a model of ceramic rings that was the National Veterans Memorial, this idea of embracing and holding the building, a kind of safe place for the stories of the veterans. So it's 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 really an exchange between language and material and kind of you know the, the sort of visceral communication. Anything that helps, basically, we're sort of ravenous for anything that helps us try to get to a, a building because I, I think it signifies probably too long of an answer. I apologize, but it signifies that we don't know what the architecture is. You know, we're trying to find it. And so that range of exploration is an attempt. There's no preconception of a building image, so. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it's clear in your work that you're struggling with different issues in every single project and dealing with the different program and different site and trying to be really honor those individualities in every project. So that, that makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. um, one of our guests asked, do you think we'll start to see architecture and, and the other art forms start to overlap more in the future as opposed to the silos of different disciplines that we have today? Man, I, I hope so. I mean, yeah, I think you're already seeing it. I think there are art and, you know, there are newer practices that are, that are even more collaborative than ours with different disciplines. I mean, I wanted to have a studio with every discipline I could imagine. <laughs> But the, I think the generation that we're in is is different. But I th I think that's the future, frankly. I, I think that's it. And you know, we we engage in those conversations. We've engaged in conversations with Richard Serra on the St. Louis Art Museum with Anne Hamilton. Oh boy, you know I could go on. Doug Aiken. But but I I think the kind of the making the dialogue truly open. Right, which is so much more than, you know, the kind of structures of public input that have been employed. Making the dialogue open where you reach into other disciplines because you need them uh, and, and that you reach into different communities, not as a formal matter, but because you really need their voice and you, you know, their voice can help you answer a question that comes up in the work. And so I, I think it's inevitable. I think this moment is already creating it. I, I just think it's it's there. We're we're going after a, an art school in um, in Newark, and we've composed one of those kind of of teams, which you know our, our leadership is gets more and more tenuous. <laughs> that we're sort of le leading a correct collective conversation, rather than you know the kind of authorship that has been driving architecture for, for quite a long time. So I, yeah, that's a great question. Um, just, let me just ask two more, okay. Um, one is after a project has been completed for a while, do you have a process uh, to measure success in terms of how you've engaged the public realm? I, li I like a good post-occupancy question. Yeah, we do not have a formal process. We have ongoing relationships with all. I mean, I, I'm happy to say we, we've become friends with virtually every client. Um, so we have ongoing conversations with them. Yeah, I'm in conversations with all of our clients, actually. So informally, yes. And, in, and informally, asking them questions like, do you need to change anything? I mean, I think it's fascinating. Uh, this idea of, of our designs setting the building in motion rather than creating a summary solution is, is fundamental to me. So this idea of reaching out to clients and, and 
asking for what change they need, things that don't work. What, you know, what can we do to help? You know, what did we get wrong? We just had that conversation with the National Veterans Memorial, actually. Um, yeah, but I mean, I think when you sustain a relationship, it's better than even formalizing it, you know, when people have the kind of freedom to reach out to you and say, we need, we need help or, you know, or our programming has changed. I mean, you wish, I mean, the, I would say the best buildings are, are open enough formats or platforms that a lot of change can happen within them. But man, change is happening so fast right now that, that uh, kind of everything's up for grabs, I think. And that's exciting to me. That's really exciting. Uh, okay, last question. What type of program or project would you love to design that you have not yet done? <laughs> There's always those, isn't there? A uh, couple different things. Uh, the first one, and in no particular order, is, is a more conceptual thing, but I, I, want to, I want to design a building that truly engages the natural systems that you know, establish its, uh, its own kind of microclimate ecosystem becomes really part of a natural system. I mean, we were, we were talking for the, to the former director of the New York Botanical Garden for a while about doing a moss pavilion, which is something I've thought about for a long time, but not, not even as, as, as thematic as that, but really think about it, you know, ra rather than buildings being um, responsible to various systems and techniques, a whole different conceptual beginning that you really study the natural systems that are happening in a place, whether it's just water in New York or you know, earth and ecology in the country where I am right now, you know, and, and really conceiving a building that, that it certainly alters it, but then alters, redirects and becomes a part of that system. I'm giving really long answers. And the second one, and to me personally, maybe the most important is, um, well, they're, they're equal because they both embody the same ideal. Uh, I really want to design spiritual space. And I don't mean, but not exclusive to, you know, any organized religion, but I, I think literally architecture, literally creating a framework and being catalytic in a conversation of ethical life and ethical living couldn't be more important at this time in our culture. And so, you know, finding a place and a time um, to do that and a client um, is, is a priority to me. And then I'll just wrap up this, this idea of cultural catalysts right now where we're working on a series of ideas of space, public space for, to honor the sense of loss or things lost, people lost, ecosystems lost, various forms of loss. And so we're creating spaces that allow for people to come together around those various, inspire people to come together around those various kinds of loss and kind of honor this idea. So all of those things. <laughs> John, you wanna take us out? Yeah, thank you very much, Brad, for a thoughtful and provocative lecture. Um, I pretty, particularly appreciated the organizational structure and how you talked about your approach and then you showed us the work and put that in context. Uh, thank you very much um, to the visitors and viewers. Uh, we will be back here in two weeks from tonight and we look forward to seeing you then. Thank you all very much. Thank you guys, it's fun.